All right. The other big um, the other term that, that we want to define along with these is so bond angle we're familiar with, right? Bond length makes a lot of sense. Bond length is the distance between two atoms. Bond angle is the angle between three atoms, right? Just like defining an angle in geometry, you need point A, center point, and point B to define an angle. The dihedral angle, we still measure it in terms of degrees, um, but dihedral angle actually requires four points to define it. So basically, the, di the dihedral angle says, okay, take that bond that you're Take that bond you're looking down. Bond itself is not really a single point. It's a line in between two nuclei, right? Or a cloud in between two nuclei, but for the sake of the geometry, call it a line. The dihedral angle is the angle that you would get between two things attached to, one attached to the front carbon, one attached to the rear carbon. So it's basic, the other way you can think of it is if you think of the of this front hydrogen and the two carbons as defining a plane, three points define a plane, right? So look at that top carbon in the two, or the top hydrogen that I did line to in the two carbons. They're defining a plane that's perpendicular to the screen, vertical, right? The dihedral angle is how far out of the plane the rear hydrogen is rotating. But it's not measured in terms of a distance, it's measured in terms of an angle because it's still attached to that rear carbon. All right, so we're gonna get more practice with that. That's still something that's is really tough to visualize. Um, Would that be like a vector or is that over two? I think, I think we call it a torsional angle. Um, but again, to get them, I know I know what the chemists call it. Um, the, the mathematicians might also call it a dihedral angle, um, for all I know. Um, it was something that we dealt with all the time when I was in grad school because I was doing computational stuff and we were looking at geometries and measuring geometries um, and with 3D modeling programs. And so we looked all the time at stuff like, oh, the dihedral has, is this, it's popped out of the, of by 60 degrees or 80 degrees or something like that. Or we did things, we did actually a lot of things, computational studies where we, what well, we essentially started from something that looked like a Newman diagram, but fully drawn out in 3D. And we would say, okay, rotate the dihedral by 60 degrees and then tell me what the energy is. Then rotate it another 60 degrees and tell me what the energy is. Um, so we would design our studies using that terminology. Um, so it would be a torsional force that you were applying. I don't know if you would call it a torsional angle. And actually, in terms of um, material strength, there's a couple different categories, right? There's compressive strength, which is how strong something is when you press on it. And there's tensile strength, which is how strong something is when you pull on it. And then there's shear strength, which is if you had if you had a block of something and you took the top and you pushed it compared to the bottom, how strong is it? And then there's torsional strength, which is if you twist it, how much force does it take to break something? Like you can ski and like how your skis perform. Yeah, it like makes like sense. Because you've got a lot of torsional force because if you're tweaking the front because you're digging in or carving in the front, and, but you're forcing your body's weight is forcing the back to be twisted at a different angle. Um, I can see why that would be the case in terms of, I would guess, I would guess that on, in icy conditions, you want stronger torsional skis, right? Because that's going to allow you to carve with the front of your blade as opposed to just what's under your foot. Yeah, but then they're less forgiving if uh, they're right. Rigid. Right. Um, so, Dihedral angle, you can think of that as being torsional. Um, dihedral, I believe, comes from di meaning two. There's two points that you're using to define that center point. For the di 
Yeah, it wouldn't be perfectly. We could draw it as as perfectly sixty, but if we actually wanted to to go in and calculate and have a computer run a simulation or measure what that angle is in its most stable state, we're probably going to find that they're not exactly sixty degrees, especially the one where the bromines are right next to each other. Those ones are going to push a little bit further apart. They'll be more than sixty degrees, and that's going to force the uh, dihedral angle of the methyl groups, say, to be closer than they would normally be. So, but yeah, exactly. That's just like with the water versus the methane with the, with the Vesper geometry, it's the same logic, All right? So we already kind of talked about this, um, staggered versus eclipsed. And lowest in energy, most stable, is always going to be staggered. Eclipsed is always going to be highest in energy. And that kind of makes sense because if you think about the eclipse confirmation, um, it's not only going to be higher in energy, it's going to be a transition state. Go back to our to your definition of, a, of potential energy surfaces from back in Gen Chem. Alexi, did you use the term potential energy surfaces? Okay. So that comes from my background. I use it all the time in Gen Chem. Um, it's basically just that that chart or the graph where you have energy on one side and reaction on the other. So if you have a if you have a low energy state where the two where you're in the staggered conformation, twisting it like we did with the Bromo one to get to a more stable conformation, we had to go through a stagger, an eclipse state, right? Where they were directly aligned with each other. That's going to be a transition state. Because either way, if you got up to that point where they were perfectly eclipsed, either way, if it rotates one degree either direction, it's downhill in energy, right? And so there's going to be a net force you downhill one way or the other. Um, in mathematical terms, it's a it's a saddle point. It's a point where it's um, where it's concave down, or it's a relative max, because nothing you can do by rotating that dihedral is going to make it higher energy than being um, directly eclipsed. Right, and so we wind up with. It's highest in energy, and it's even to the point where we wouldn't necessarily call it a conformer because it's not stable. It's not, not going to stay in the eclipse. It has to go through the eclipse confirmation to get from one staggered to the next staggered. All right, and so if you actually took just ethane and you started with it totally um, staggered, and you rotated it, the dihedral 60 degrees to get it eclipsed, you go up in energy, and then if you keep rotating, it goes back down again, right? Then you wind up with this sine wave, effectively. It, from a pure math standpoint, it's not actually a sine wave. It looks really, you can model it with the sine wave, but the shape's a little bit different. Um, but effectively, you can keep doing this infinitely, right? Just keep rotating one of them and keep the other one still, it'll be constantly going through the eclipse, staggered, eclipse, staggered, eclipse, staggered. So every time, and we can actually calculate and measure this, this number, every time two hydrogens pass by each other, you get an energy barrier of four kilojoules per mole. Now, in this case, the overall distance um, difference it's a 12 kilojoule per mole barrier to go from staggered to eclipsed, and then it'll gain that energy back when it rotates to the next staggered confirmation. And that's because you have three, every time you do that, you have three hydrogens bumping into each other, right? And so 12 divided by three, it's about four kilojoules per mole for each hydrogen. What would happen if, it, if we had propane why? Let's draw it. So let's draw instead of 
that are on the ethane, I'm just going to replace one of these red hydrogens with a CH3. <laughs> yeah. You're thinking along the right lines, but you got the wrong answer yeah. for now. For now. Right, so the hydrogens passing by each other gave us four kilojoules per mole each. A methyl passing by a hydrogen, that's bigger than a hydrogen. So yeah, it's a little further apart, but it's also got more electron clouds taking up more space. So methyl passing by a hydrogen is going to be a higher barrier. So instead of an overall 12 kilojoules per mole, when we look at propane, we're going to get something I had that one on as the next no, butane. Um, it's going to be something a little bit bigger. And we have sort of a, a table of like, oh, a hydrogen passing by, by a methyl group is this amount. I think it's it's like six or seven kilojoules compared to four kilojoules for hydrogens passing by each other. But a bromine passing by a methyl group is going to be bigger than that. Right. And so, and again, we, I don't expect you to have those all memorized at any point. Um, other than some, maybe some of the most basic ones, but I would tell you ahead of time if that was the case. Um, but really where it gets interesting is where we start having something that's not symmetrical. So for propane, where one of these was a methyl group, every time it rotates 60 degrees or 120 degrees, it's going, that propane, or sorry, that methyl group is going by another hydrogen, right? So it would still be a symmetrical sine wave-ish thing um, where every 120 degrees looks the same as the 120 degrees before it. Where it starts getting interesting is when you have two things that are different, like butane. Each carbon has two different substituents for butane. So this is just um, for butane. So for this conformer, So we're viewing from up and to the left. What is the Newman projection going to look like? Out to say that it's rotating, would it be similar to the resonance structures where they're just lines to show that one to the next? I find it helpful to show to show a line. Um, if I was drawing it like this, I would show it like draw a curved arrow, like I'm twisting this way. Oh, with the Newman projection, I would probably draw and I'll show we'll demonstrate it in a minute, but I would draw an arrow around the outside indicating which way it's rotating. So for this position, we had the front hydrogen, we had, or sorry, front carbon, hydrogens up and left, hydrogens up into the right, and a CH3 down. And for the rear, right, so our Newman projection looked like this. If we rotated the blue hydrogen or the blue substituents counterclockwise, Wittershins, we get a methyl passing by a hydrogen, a methyl passing by a hydrogen, and a hydrogen passing by a hydrogen, right? So we have three interactions. And then, but if we rotate it the other way, we get two hydrogen hydrogen eclipses 
in a methyl methyl eclipse, that's going to be a different amount of energy, right? So you get a more complicated looking potential energy surface because you get something that looks like this. So in this, for this um, molecule, we could have them completely opposite from each other. We started with them being in this adjacent, but still staggered, right? Which, and then rotating between, rotating the front or the, um, yeah, rotating the front this way, we get this front methyl passing by the back methyl. So this one's showing it reverse from the way I usually do it. It's rotating what's in front and keeping one in the back the same, but the logic's the same, right? That's gonna be a bigger barrier because you're making the two carbons pass by each other. It's harder than making a carbon pass by hydrogen. And definitely harder than making two hydrogens pass by each other. And so you wind up with our most stable conformers are the ones where they're staggered and in opposite directions, which is what we call anti. So these were color-coded. I don't know something about when I saved it, lost the color coding. Um, anti means that your two largest substituents are, are opposite from each other. Or mo more specifically, when we use this term, we would we would be specific about the two methyls are in the anti position. Or like for our dibromo um, butane earlier, we, we could say the two bromos need to be anti to be in the most stable configuration, which might not be the same. We wouldn't say that the whole molecule is in the anti configuration. Anti configuration is referring specifically to two of the substituents. So we have to be careful with our language with that. Me included, because I have a tendency to be like, oh, it's anti. That specifically, you're talking about two substituents, so you need to define those two substituents usually. Um, and when they're, if they're staggered, but still adjacent to each other, call that gauche. Um, which I believe shares a common root, both with the fashion term, all right, it's, it's a little bit derogatory to say, oh, that's so gauche, it means that they're trying too hard. They're close, but they're not really there. It's like nouveau riche, they're, they're trying too hard. Um, and I believe it actually comes from the same root originally as, is it UC Santa Barbara? It's the gauchos, is the Spanish word. Um, the gauchos were the ones that were adjacent to bullfighting, but weren't really participating in it. They were the bullfighting fans. And so they were close, but not quite there. They were trying too hard. The, now San Diego is the Tritons. It's one of the Southern California UCs, the gauchos. I think it's Santa Barbara. All right, so what does all this mean as far as what I might expect you to be able to do on a quiz? Well, I don't expect you to be able to, um, to come up with this on the fly. But I would expect you to be able to look at butane or a molecule. And, and if I say, okay, what's the lowest energy con uh, confirmation? For you to be able to both draw the human projections the way it starts and then figure out what's the lowest energy state. Um, maybe by the time we get to the midterm, we might be in a position where um, I might expect you to qualitatively be able to come up with something like this. Um, but probably no more complicated. If you had, if you had our diagonal butane, it's going to be an even more complicated potential energy surface, right? Because every rotation is going to be different. At least this one had two that were symmetrical. You started from here and rotated this way versus that way, you get the same energy surface. Adding the two bromines interacting with each other, that's another interaction that's going to be different. Every a bromine rotating past a bromine.
bromine is different than a bromine rotating past the methyl group, which is different than a bromine rotating past the hydrogen, which is different from a methyl passing by a methyl, which is, yeah. So you can see how you get lots of all of the, all of those different interactions put together is what you get that we were representing as this overall 19 kilojoules per mole. That one would be more than I would expect on a, on a midterm, maybe on a take home part of, of the final or something like that. Um, to, so it would be relative to each other, though, right? So it's just, I mean, it doesn't need to be exactly right. It's still qualitative, like, yeah. and you can still look at it relative to okay, if this is zero, we can still predict, we might, might not be able to predict what this difference is, but just by looking at what's running into what, there's a table that says, okay, a methyl methyl eclipse interaction is this many kilojoules per mole and a methyl hydrogen interaction is this many kilojoules so you could sum it all up if you could sit there and take your time and add it okay these are all the three interactions that i get when i rotate here and then when i rotate again i get a different three interactions so i'm going to sum them up um it's doable and you can get pretty close to these same numbers if you have that table handy but it's not something I expect you to have memorized for sure. It would be on an open book part of the test, if anything. Actually, more likely, I would give you that table on the test and say, here's the table of everything that might be relevant. What's the potential energy surface look like? And what's the difference in energy between the, um, the most stable conformer and the least stable uh, transition state? Something like that. All right, so let's just let's do some more practice. Rotating only the C three C four bond, which is that one. Identify the lowest energy confirmation. So start by drawing it the way it is. And if we care mostly about the C3, C4, pick one of the directions. It doesn't really matter which one you draw in front, which one you draw behind for answering this question. By convention, we've been looking at it from the left-hand side. So if we're down here, looking at it, start draw the Newman projection and then figure out what it looks like for the lowest and highest energy states. Bruce. Yeah, everything that's attached. So there's there's one methyl on carbon three, but then carbon three, if we just look at C3 and C4, it, this would be considered an ethyl group from that point of view, right? And from relative to C4, that's an ethyl group. So you have those, you have three different substituents to deal with besides hydrogens. 
right? So getting the <laughs> <it's quite bad. laughs> um, but if you do the same thing that I did, but rotated 180 degrees, it's still the same thing. Yeah, that's why I just <laughs> right. You might have just drawn it from the other side. So to get our lowest energy confirmation, we want to minimize all of the steric interactions. We want as little interacting as possible. And the most important one is usually get your biggest objects, your biggest substituents on opposite sides in the anti-configuration. So what are our biggest substituents on the blue carbon? Yeah, it's not actually that much bigger than a methyl as far as, as these interactions go, because there's only one carbon that's directly attached, right? Even though it's the whole thing has two carbons and, and two more hydrogens, the fact that it's still just one carbon that's attached and it's still just a tetrahedral carbon means it really doesn't take up that much more space than a methyl group, but a little bit more. That's the lowest thing. So, yeah, and, and for a red carbon, it's still we've got a meth or an ethyl group and then two hydrogens, right? So ethyl is definitely the biggest there. So they're already the anti configuration, which means at first glance, this looks like this is that's probably is the lowest energy confirmation. You want to double check there's not some way that we could we could get fewer interactions, but no matter which way, if we rotated the red carbons. Either way, we're putting our ethyl group gauche to the other ethyl group as opposed to anti. And we don't gain anything else by doing that because if we put the the, C, the red ethyl group up into the right, now it's gauche to the methyl group and to the ethyl group. If we put it over here, up into the left, it's gauche to the other ethyl group. Now it's anti to the methyl group, but we didn't really gain anything, right? With this molecule, you have to have two of the carbon substituents next to each other. So it might as well not be the two biggest ones. So this is our lowest energy. And again, partly because of my background, um, I was I was taught in grad school not to think about transition states as being stable confirmations. So from the, the language that my research group in grad school used, we wouldn't consider a transition state to be a confirmer. But for the sake, most textbooks don't make that distinction. So I'm gonna try to follow with what the textbook says and say that highest energy confirmation can include a transition state. In fact, and if we're using that, it means it will have to be a transition state. So right? it's, going to be the others. it's going to be the eclipse of the ethyls. And the trick then is just to make sure you draw it so that, in this case, both of the other two red substituents are the same, right? So it's going to be a hydrogen here and a hydrogen there. But if one of them was different than the other, you would need to be careful not to, or that you rotated the, all of them correctly to get there. Right, but so we rotate everything 180 degrees. And again, one of the ways that you can show that, especially easy if you're color coded, is just use the same color as the ones that you want to rotate. But I'm going to rotate the rear um, carbon 180 degrees. And we're going to get, Again, it's always helpful to keep something constant. Don't try to rotate both of them simultaneously. It can be done, but there's no point. You're just going to confuse yourself and for no benefit. Yeah, you just turn the paper. Right. <laughs> so then our eclipsed, our two ethyls are eclipsed. That's going to be our highest energy confirmation. If we're not including transition states, I guess that's the other thing I'll do. I'll try to do when I'm writing my own questions, I will be explicit 
excluding transition states or including transition states to, to distinguish between this. If we're excluding transition states, what's the highest energy? The one that puts ethyls adjacent to it, but those are, there's two choices there. Yeah, gouge between the ethyl and the methyl. And so, because that one's going to be slightly different energy than gouged the ethyl, but not the methyl. Right, so this is going to be one of those complicated potential energy surfaces where you actually have three different, it's not symmetrical at all. It'll start repeating once you get back to 360 degrees rotation, but it's not going to be symmetrical at all because you've got three different energies. If we just think about rotating the red part, this one is higher in energy than putting it here, which is higher energy than putting it here. The previous graph that we looked at, is that it from the point of view of one of these atomic groups? From the point of view of the entire molecule. The entire molecule. Yeah. But usually in this case, because if, if we just think about the, the blue is staying still and the red is doing the rotating, there's only one substituent besides hydrogen. Yeah, the hydrogens pass on other hydrogens. It's going to have its own interaction, but we can think about it just as there's three possible states for the ethyl group that are all going to be different energy. So it doesn't really matter where the hydrogens are because the hydrogens are just wherever the ethyl isn't. Right, so our potential energy surface then for this one would look like something like, let's see if I can do it from memory of my double light screen. When the two ethyls are anti, you're down here, and then slightly higher in energy to have the ethyl, the gauche gauche. And then in between the two to have the methyl anti from the ethyl, but having the two ethyls gouged to each other. And so we wind up with some, and then the transition states, this would be a lower transition state than this one. Because to go from, from where we started with the two ethyls anti to putting the anti, the back ethyl in the gauche gauche, it only had to pass by a methyl group. So that's going to be a little bit lower in energy than having our ethyls have to go through the eclipse state. So we wind up with something like, like this. Clearly not to scale at all. Um, but the, the point is that we can, we can build them and they're really not going to be, yes, this is going to be periodic. If we continued this, then it would get back to where we started, right? And then it would repeat. But it's not really a sine wave. It's this weird sine wave-ish thing, but it's really represented as each of these being parabolas that kind of interact with each other. The concave up parabola, that morphs into a concave down parabola. Um, if you think about doing that, those more complicated um, polynomials, in graphing them out, when you had like an X to the cube, you could have something where you had up and down and up and down. It's really one of those that then repeats. So it's like halfway between a polynomial and a sine wave. Um, but it doesn't, it's not really either, which is weird. Well, it's sine times cosine, which evens out to a polynomial. You can, you can, you can get close to this and represent it with periodic function. It starts basically, but you're basically fitting a function to the points that you know exist rather than it being a true function on its own. And it's not going to be perfectly accurate. Um, it's good enough for the sake of modeling and showing things, but it wouldn't be exactly how it actually is in real life. 
which is, and this is this is why physicists and mathematicians don't like chemistry and where chemistry has the edge so, well, this is what it actually is so we guys can pretend all you want by, by ignoring <laughs> variables but it really is messy all right i think that that's about we'll talk about strain energy this is what kind of we talked about it briefly earlier um if any time you can force it out of its standard quote unquote desired geometry there's some strain energy and so the rotational strain energy we were just talking about the torsional strain energy is when you get the things that are just big and pushing on each other but you can also do it by kind of strain by constraining things based on the geometry like if you take something cycle cyclopropane is really, really unstable because you took tetrahedral carbons that want to be 109.5 degrees from each other and you're forcing them to be closer to 60 degrees. Um, and it turns out even the bonds that we can explain this because basically when you force it to be in this equilateral triangle shape, the, the orbitals will actually resist that. And to the point where you don't have as much overlap between your your sp3 orbitals, and so if there's less overlap, that's not as strong a bond. You get the strongest bonds when you have the most overlap. Oh, that was the one earlier. Um, and so by forcing it to be in these strained geometries, you actually weaken the bonds because you're limiting how much bond, um, orbital overlap you can get. But I don't. We're not. Gonna, we're going to spend more time with that next week. I just wanted, since we mentioned it earlier and it was the next slide, I thought it was worth looking at that. Um, for the quiz this weekend, it has you doing some, some Alpine nomenclature, um, but I think it's mostly focused on um, you know, drawing some Newman projections. And I think it has a which is going to be more stable state to work. Actually, there's um, two of the questions are just, are these isomers or conformers? So are they the same molecule drawn differently or are they um, two different molecules? So just a little bit of the 3D visualization, trying to wrap your head around that. Those ones should feel pretty easy to you, I would think at this point, but with all this new information, sometimes it's harder to, to tell. Um, and then a couple of new projection questions. All right, we'll end a little bit early. We can go out, um, go over to the lab and to take your melting points for the stuff that we did on Tuesday. Um, and then, uh, I got to go over there and I had to bring a bunch of chemicals over to the high school yesterday. So I need to put those away so that they're rattling around my front seat right now. <laughs>